All right, please bear with me, everybody. I <laughs> My computer is not the latest and greatest. Um, and sometimes it does have a mind of its own, so I will just say that ahead of time. Um, but thank you guys for coming today to our risk management training um, for our student organizations. My name is Alexandra Brown. Um, if you guys haven't heard, I recently got married during the pandemic in 2020. So my last name, if you see it different on emails, it used to be Briggs, now it's Brown. Um, just so you guys know, it's still me, uh, just different last name. I appreciate you guys coming today. Um, let's get a little bit into the agenda. Start, oh, there we go. Um, so first, we're gonna talk about the adoption of the risk management program, why it's important, why we're doing it. Um, after that, we're going to talk about the alcohol drug policy, go into some overdose and response techniques. Um, hazing, we'll talk about sexual misconduct, abuse, and harassment. A little bit about fire and safety issues, including weapons and explosives. We're going to talk a little bit about um, accommodating students with disabilities. A brief touch on um, student travel policies and procedures, RSO events, and then just another brief summary of COVID-19, which you guys are familiar with at this point. Um, so let's get started. So first is Clay's bill, um, which is House Bill 2639. So Clay Warren was a student actually at Texas Tech, um, and he tragically passed away in a car accident coming home from his fraternity event in 2002. So because of that, um, Clay's bill was enacted in 2007 also known as House Bill 2639, um, and that kind of started the whole risk management training. All right, so as mentioned, on September 1st, on 2007, they um, discussed in Texas legislature making it mandatory for risk management training to be presented to all student organizations, which also requires officers and advisors to attend training. And then it also requires you as an advisor um, to report about the training to all of your RSO members. Now that can be a verbal presentation that can be giving them the link and having them view it. You can uh, go through some of the slides, uh, but they do require not only that the officers and advisors complete the full training, um, but you give a summary essentially to all of your members okay um and i really like this quote so the goal is to make sure that every bit everyone on campus knows there are some guidelines to follow before planning activities such as parties and trips and just as important to discourage hazing boozing and other illegal activities now one one wonderful thing i would say about our campus is that you know being a community college we do not have fraternities parties on campus. So we kind of avoid most of the risk management issues, um, but there are still plenty of risk management issues um, that we need to be aware of. So I did want to highlight this, that yes, we're not seeing parties um, on campus or anything like that, um, but these um, issues do come into effect. Now, along with this policy, um, this is a very important aspect of being involved in a registered student organization. So we are requiring this information which helps with the planning and organizing events on campus it is the rso's responsibility though to consider potential risks at all of their events and meetings and as well as travel to ensure the safety and well-being of our students so that's basically what the risk management policy is all about is you know we know that there are risks involved and we just want everybody to be aware of what kind of risks we have and this is straight um, the LSC policy VID 105, <laughs> um, which it talks about the required risk management training for student groups. Again, um, just looking at it, it doesn't say that the representatives or officers of the IS of the provide an overview of the contents at, at the next school meeting. Um, we know that you guys probably don't have any student members right now, which is Totally fine, like we're in a building state of mind, we're in a building, uh, building everything back up after COVID. So while it it does say in here that you have to provide an overview of the contents um, to your full membership at their first full meeting, as soon as 
you get a good decent chunk of students probably by I would assume September or October then I would say go ahead and do that and then once you know that information um, that has been given to your RSO members then you just need to email me the date that it was given to them because we use that information for risk management training uh, tracking so I send that information to system office so just be aware of that now what is risk management training so as we'll discuss further it is the process of considering potential risks for our students and also the college when we're planning events and uh, monitoring organization activities and taking both proactive steps and corrective action to minimize injury and or loss by <laughs> adjusting behavior and our processes or limiting the activity altogether um, so basically it we're processing those risks understanding what risks are involved and if we have to adjust the process for our events or meetings um, in order to eliminate those risks or as many risks as possible that's what we'll do otherwise you know eliminating the activity altogether so i'm I'm not going to read through everything on this slide, but these are the types of risks that we consider um, with risk management training. So you've got physical risks, uh, reputational risks, emotional, financial facilities, um, which, you know, as you can see, this information came from Arizona State University. So this talks about each of those things in depth. Um, and I'll be sending this presentation out to everybody that is attending um, so you guys will be able to listen and look at this information too but these are the main types of risks that we're looking for when we're trying to assess during our events all right so let's dive into alcohol and drugs to start okay so over time i'm sure you guys have heard different statistics involved with alcohol related injuries um, this is just some data i have it's not the most recent data um, but this was when we first started putting this information in so according to our sources over 1825 students between the ages of 19 to 24 die annually from alcohol related injuries and also 6 67367 um, from drug overdose deaths now these numbers most likely um, have risen um, since this data was added to our information but it is just something to note um, for further information. Oh, I think my PowerPoint just shut down on me. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> I told you my computer has a mind of its own. Anyhow, um, so along with that is drug and alcohol abuse. So there are, are major risks involved and effects um, when dealing with drug and alcohol abuse. One of the risks is that you have a higher chance of developing an addiction, which can result in a overdose, whether it's accidental or intentional. Now, high risk drinking. So this is um, including underage drinking, drinking and driving, um, and other activities that are similar to that. Drinking when you have health conditions or medications that make it dangerous for you as well as binge drinking. So those are what we consider a high risk drinking factors. Uh, for men, that equals five drinks concurrently. For women, that is four drinks concurrently. And I really like this image. Uh, it shows a standard drink. And as you can see, though the percentage of alcohol in the drink is getting higher, the volume of the actual liquid is getting lower. And I think that that's something especially um, our students will need to know um, because you know they might see oh it's only five percent alcohol in that or it's 40 percent but it's only one little thing but that's 40 percent in one tiny 1.5 fluid ounce so um, obviously mixing and stuff like that is not recommended either uh, but I just like this representation um, of a standard drink to show you how they really stack up to each other now these are the specific alcohol policies we have um, related to LSC. So in these, I'll just sum it up for you guys. Um, so LSC strives to provide an alcohol and drug-free workplace and learning environment. And it's important to note that no group or individual will be 
permitted to serve or bring alcoholic beverages in or upon LSC facilities, which includes any RSO events. So in other words, we're a dry campus. So bringing alcohol on campus or to any of the facilities is a violation of um, the policy and could result in disciplinary action. Now, along with that, um, providing alcohol to minors is a class A misdemeanor. It is punishable by a fine of up to $4,000 and or jail time. It can also affect your future employment as well as the minors in uh, that is drinking, their future employment and involvement in certain careers, we'll say in the future. So that's something to be aware of. Um, a little bit about DUI and DWI offenses. So Texas has a zero tolerance law for minors driving with any alcohol in their system. Um, and as you can see on the slide, there are multiple consequences for minors driving under the influence. And then also any person driving while intoxicated in a public place results in a jail confinement, as you can see. So we've got the top information of the driving under the influence um, and the minors driving while intoxicated and then also driving while intoxicated with an open container. Okay, so when medical assistance is needed, we also adopted this 911 life law, a uh, lifeline law, excuse me. Um, this was passed in 2011 and it basically states that if a person under 21 calls 911 for someone else who has alcohol poisoning as a way to save their life, that they'll not be charged for possessing and or consuming alcohol as well. This only applies to the first person that calls for medical assistance and they must stay at the scene and also cooperate with EMS and law enforcement officers. So um, essentially this was put in place because um, 911 and you know law enforcement would rather you save a life if you're um, a minor under the influence than for you to be too afraid to call to save someone's life. Um, but again, it only counts for the first person. Now, these are some common symptoms and signs of alcohol overdose or poisoning. So some of those include vomiting, seizure, difficulty breathing, um, slow heart rate, bluish pale skin, slow responses, and extremely low body temperature. Now, what to do if you overdose on alcohol or if a loved one overdoses? I'm not gonna read through all of this, but essentially, um, if someone is in the presence of you and they're overdosing, immediately call 911. But um, any of the following procedures will, following procedures, excuse me, will help. But make sure that you're not putting your own life at risk um, by performing any of these procedures. So you know if they're they're getting aggressive at all, um, just make sure you're not putting your own life on the line. We don't want that either. One procedure I find very effective um, that can be life-saving to know that I really want to highlight is the Bacchus maneuver. I believe that's how they um, pronounce that. So essentially, it's for when someone is drinking. Um, so you raise the arm that's closest to you above their above their head and prepare to roll them towards you. And you basically roll them on their side and then prop their head up with their hands so that they don't choke on their own vomit. Um, and they're able to breathe and their airways are clear. Now, um, preventing alcohol overdose and poisoning. So this is very similar um, to the information we've talked about before. Um, not consuming alcohol obviously is the best way to prevent that, uh, but taking any of the steps here will decrease your likelihood. Um, you know, knowing your limits, avoid mixing alcohol and using a designated driver while um, drinking, Uber, Lyft, um, all of that is very popular now. So um, there should be no excuse to not find a designated driver. But again, um, these are just precautions. Now to go into drug use, uh, drug use and abuse can affect a person in many different ways. It can be physical, emotional, um, financial, reputational. Uh, please note that it's illegal to use, manufacture, sell, and or distribute any substances um, here in Texas. So 
that's regulated under chapters 481 through 485 of the Texas Health and Safety Code. All right, so a little bit about the controlled dangerous substances um, and the drug possession under Texas law. So what we consider controlled dangerous substances here is heroin, cocaine, meth, marijuana, manufactured narcotics, steroids, depressants, and stimulants. So the possession in any of these can range in penalties from a misdemeanor to a severe penalty. And it is based on you know, all these factors below, quantity, how it was concealed, possession of the drug with other paraphernalia, excuse me, um, having a large amount of drugs and any past conviction. So it really just depends um, on those different factors. Now, symptoms and signs of drug overdose are, some of them are similar um, to alcohol, uh, you know, overdose. Um, those include dilated pupils, severe difficulty breathing, paranoia, agitation, um, unconsciousness, unresponsiveness, gurgling sounds. Um, so these are just some things you want to be aware of when it comes to that. But obviously not using drugs is the best way to prevent that. So what to do if you are overdosing on drugs? So immediately call 911 um, if you or someone you love is and you're able to. Um, in addition, same procedures basically as alcohol um, overdose. You'll call 911, wait for someone to arrive, but again, do not put your life in danger if they become aggressive or if you're, you know, you fear for your life in that situation. Um, you know, just call 911 if you can. And then preventing a drug overdose. So obviously, again, not using drugs is the best way to prevent that. Uh, but taking any steps below um, will increase your like decrease your likelihood of an overdose, um, increasing your awareness over signs and risks involved, you know, knowing what drugs react with what foods or drinks, um, seeking treatment if you need, those sort of things. Now we're on to hazing. We'll talk a little bit about hazing. All right, so uh, um, hazing essentially is a ritual that involves risk, pain, or harm to gain some form of initiation, which can involve alcohol consumption or ritualized pain. Hazing has led to deaths on college campuses, which has led to anti-hazing laws in the United States. Um, you know, we know for the bigger sense of universities, uh, fraternities and sororities do initiation and hazings more often than you would just see um, in one of our clubs on campus, I would, I would hope. Um, we wouldn't see it at all. Um, but just so you guys know, you know, hazing can occur at any time and it, and it can be, you know, emotional or physical pain. Okay, so again, this slide uh, discusses in detail what the term hazing includes. So to summarize, it includes physical brutality, um, physical activities that, you know, sleep deprivation, including one, any activity that can involve the consumption of food and liquor and drugs, um, anything that actively intimidates or threatens the student, and then um, any activity that induces, causes, or requires the student to perform a duty or task that is in violation of the penal code. And obviously, like I said, I'll send this out um, so you guys can read it further if need be. Now, as of spring of 2020, there is a report that will be published on the LSE website at all times um, that identifies any hazing incidents against an organization registered or recognized by the college. So as of 2020, um, to be in compliance of Texas law, we have to publish that on the website. The public report will contain information about who committed the hazing, who it was against, when it occurred, um, date of investigation, what violations were involved, criminal charges involved, and sanctions imposed on the organization. Now, as LSC policy states, um, hazing as defined is any intentional, no or reckless act against a student that endangers their mental health, physical health, or safety. And RSO cannot require such acts for membership, whether 
for honor off the college's property and all reports of hazing are to be treated as serious and should be reported immediately. Now, personal hazing offenses occur when a person engages in hazing or helps others to engage in a hazing, but organizational hazing, a little bit different, um, occurs when a whole organization um, condones and encourages hazing or assists in it. Now, this is just a continuation of the laws regarding the prosecution of an offense, stating that the court may grant immunity from prosecution for the offense to those subpoenaed to testify for the prosecution and who does not testify um, for the prosecution. This is just uh, more information, including that. Now, in regards to reporting hazing, uh, please submit a report to the Student Life Office. This is a little bit of a continuation of the laws after it as well. Um, again, hazing is never tolerated, whether it is consensual or not. So if you see this activity in your student organization, please report it to Student Life immediately. All right, let's get into sexual misconduct, abuse, and harassment. I don't know why I said that. Um, with my chipper Student Life voice, it is not chipper at all. Um, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, this is the policy that is the LC policy relating to misconduct. So the college covers this material in IXA11. Um, and it's important to know that the college does not tolerate sexual misconduct or retaliation against anyone who complains uh, about sexual misconduct. Now, here are some of the terms where misconduct is listed. Um, the first is sexual harassment, and sexual harassment includes two different things. Also, work environment sexual harassment and also quid pro quo. Um, when it comes to hostile environment harassment, it's more verbal, physical, or visual forms of harassment that are sexual in nature, unwelcome, and creates a hostile work environment. Now, quid pro quo refers to a form of harassment where a person um, uses their power um, or a greater performance that would be based on whether the person submits to an unwelcome sexual conduct. So um, obviously hostile work environment would be, you know, harassment in the workplace, harassment, um, an RSO officer, an advisor harassing them. But quid pro quo is this for that, as they say. So if you perform a sexual act on me, then you get membership into this club, essentially. So um, both of those are prohibited. Now we have some definitions here, some more definitions. So sexual assault includes rape, fondling, incest, or statutory rape. Sexual discrimination includes any discrimination on the basis of sex. And sexual violence is any physical sexual act without a person's consent. Excuse me, guys, I have really bad allergies today. Um, now, consent is a voluntary and positive agreement between those engaging in sexual activity. Stalking um, includes any repeated or unwanted attention, harassment, or conduct where a person fears for their safety or the safety of others. Title IX harassment includes sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, and sexual violence. But to read the whole section on um, misconduct, you can go to the link right down here. Um, for the website and you'll be able to see that. Now, when confronted with sexual misconduct, first um, report to the police and submit written documentation for that the person that has experienced se sexual misconduct, excuse me, um, seek a network of support, seek professional counseling, Utilize campus resources and advocates, and then implement protective or restraining orders if necessary. Now, these are some resources for complaints. We have internal and external. So um, I would recommend you guys, if you are going to go through this in the future, to print maybe this slide in particular and have it up somewhere important in case anybody asks you um, for any of these resources. But we have you know, the external resources such as Family Time Crisis Counseling Center, um, Sexual Assault Hotline, Northwest Assistance Ministries, et cetera, Houston Police Department, and then 
Karen Miner is our Title IX coordinator, so she would receive those complaints for campus. Now, a little bit about fire safety, weapons, and other campus safety. Okay, so for fire safety, always have a plan. Fire alarm equals evacuate the building immediately, um, whether or not it's drill. Help others if necessary or possible. I don't know why it <laughs> moved over, but um, have a meeting place. And we usually have a location, you know, when we um, do our drills. Call in the exact location of the fire if you can to 911. And then if you haven't already, sign up for the LSC text and email alerts in your My Lone Star portal. This will keep you up to date on anything that is going on on campus, fires, tornadoes, uh, severe weather, all of that. Now, we'll discuss a little bit about the policy uh, for prohibited weapons. So for full definition, um, go to the link BIE 102, but these are what we include for prohibited weapons and what we consider to be prohibited weapons. So firearms, ammunition, explosive weapons, illegal knives, taser, knuckles, um, chemical dispensing device, zip gun, or club. But as far as campus carry, Lone Star College has designated certain rules and regulations regarding gun-free zones. The designation of these zones can only be approved by the chancellor, but as of 2017, an LTC holder may carry their firearm into campus buildings unless it is an exclusion zone, which will be clearly marked. Um, and I'm sure most of you have seen on doors on campus, it'll say whether or not um, they're allowed to bring campus carry it, have a weapon on campus. Now, uh, there are posters displayed all around campus about information for what to do in the following emergencies. It's very helpful to review this information, especially annually, like we're doing now, uh, regarding these scenarios, especially after the scenario that occurred with the lockdown on campus. So I'm sure most of you <laughs> remember, you know, right before the pandemic, um, add to the the craziness of that year, um, but when we had the unexpected lockdown on campus and, you know, we didn't know what was going on, we weren't following some of the protocols, so it's it's good to, you know, review this information all the time so you are prepared in those situations. Again, um, at the bottom of this slide, we have LSC police and medical number where to dial from a campus phone, 5911, and then their direct line as well as fire um, on campus. So save those numbers into your phones if you have not already. Next, we will discuss a little bit about accommodations and issues um, with students with disabilities. Now, Section 504 prohibits the discrimination against people with disabilities and works with ADI, ADA, excuse me, and IDEA to protect children and adults with disabilities from exclusion or unequal treatment. So student organizations do not discriminate against persons with disabilities. All are welcome to participate, but if you or any students or staff or faculty that do um, help with those events um, do need accommodations to participate in any activities, please refer them to the Disability Services Office. Um, Leanne is not with us anymore, she retired, but um, Excuse me, I believe Shannon is the new person um, over there, Shannon or Sharon, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. Sharon Kenmore, thank you so much. Um, so she'll be in charge now um, of disability services for the time being. And so if you have any students that need wheelchair assistance to get to your events or your meetings um, or any other accommodations, an interpreter or anything like that, you'll want to refer them to her and she'll be able to um, help to accommodate them. Thank you again um, for redirecting me with her name. I apologize. Um, so according to board policy, the college believes in equal access to educational opportunities and has committed to making reasonable accommodations for qualified individuals with disabilities. And that's in BID 11, or excuse me, 11 um, of the LSC board policy. Now, students are responsible for identifying themselves as individuals requesting accommodations. 
Um, again, Sharon is our disability services counselor currently at the Kingwood campus. So if you or a student you know needs any assistance, whether it even be not in a club, um, but they ask you for any accommodations, um, this is <laughs> Leanne's information, um, but the office is still there um, and Sharon would be available to provide that information. Now, briefly about um, travel. So as mentioned, probably in the email that you guys saw from the chief operating officer, um, we got the email that said college sponsored travel for students is currently suspended. But if any changes happen, you know, let us know. So that's why I said we'll just briefly touch on some of this. Uh, so travel can include an organization participating in conventions, workshops, athletic events and competitions, and non-athletic events and competitions. Modes of transportation may vary from airplanes, college-owned or leased cars or vans, commercial-owned and operated buses and vans, or um, personal vehicles. Now, travel requires paperwork most of the time. We never did get a clarification on this must be at least further than 25 miles from the closest LSC campus, because that would insist that like, most of the time you will not complete uh, paperwork, but um, you know, you, student life does require you to give us the paperwork, the necessary travel paperwork, you know, um, for risk management purposes. Now, the list of documents below includes what must be submitted to the Office of Student Life for travel. You can also find the forms on the website at the link included on this slide. Um, most of you are familiar with them because you've probably seen them in the past if you travel often. Um, um, but all of this information, like I said, is on the website for your pool. Now, when it applies to student-owned vehicles that are used for non-academic travel, um, the following list um, excuse me, applies. So if you are having students that are providing their own transportation, this information would apply to them. And most of the time we do see that if you're having an event off campus, most students would drive themselves. Um, but good times the college will provide transportation. A driver that transports students must be not only uh, have a driver's license, but they have to be in a college employee that is approved um, and they have to have a satisfactory driving record. There are also some other driver responsibilities listed below um, that you'll need to follow. Now, in summary, you can view the student travel policy on the website, but it is important to remember that planning ahead is the key when it comes to traveling. But if you ever have any additional questions, please reach out to myself or another um, student life staff member and we can assist you further. Um, and we're always seeing changes, especially now. So if anything changes, we will let you guys know as it occurs. Next, we're gonna discuss RSO events. Um, as you probably read as well in the email from the chief operating officer, um, students can meet and have events on and off campus now. So that is super exciting. And I'm hoping that this will bring our students back and um, amp up your memberships in all of your clubs. Um, the three foot rule is still in place. And of course we would encourage students to wear masks, but we cannot require that. Is that the next slide? Okay, perfect, sorry. Um, when hosting events that will require the use of funds, please make sure that you fill out the RSO fund request form. That is also on the website for you guys to submit. Um, and this will be submitted for approval. So you have to submit it every time you spend funds regardless, um, but especially for your events. So that way um, we have that information and you can plan ahead. So if you know you're gonna have a meeting and you need X, Y, and Z things for each meeting every month, um, you can fill them out ahead of time and submit them. Let me go right back for a second. Um, all LSC policies for student organizations apply whether you hold the 
event on or off campus go. Um, so it is important to consider all risk management potential risks um, and work to minimize them. So again, the policies relating to student organizational events is in effect whether you have it on or off campus. Now we'll go to COVID-19. I'm sure you guys are so tired of talking about it. Um, I know I am definitely tired of referring to COVID-19, but again, it is what it is, so we will make do. Now, um, there are the most common symptoms with COVID-19 listed here. I'm sure we've heard all of the symptoms before, but as we know, these can be displayed differently and could take two to 14 days to even show symptoms. If you are sick, here are some steps to follow. Um, you know, staying home, stay hydrated, stay in touch with the doctor, um, stay in a specific room away from others if you can, wear your mask, uh, wash your hands often, all of the general things you should do, whether you're sick with COVID-19 or anything, um, other than, you know, stay away from your in a separate room. You could, you don't have to do that. Um, COVID-19 prevention, the biggest tip, you know, that we've learned, wear a mask, um, cover your nose when you're sneezing, cover your mouth when you're coughing, clean and disinfect frequently. Again, um, you know, from experience today, we had one of our outdoor events and we had students there. So we were sanitizing, we offered them san hand sanitizer, um, we had masks on the table in case anybody needed one. And then we were also wearing masks um, and making sure to, you know, sanitize as much as possible. Okay. Can you guys help me? Thank you. Woo, running. And again, this slide will be sent to you guys via email. Um, so you'll already have the slideshow if you have any questions regarding it in the future. And this workshop will be put on the YouTube channel um, so your students can watch it and you can rewatch it if you ever have any more questions. But um, if you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. But I mean, actually, while you're doing that, your last task um, as officers and advisors um, is to complete the risk training quiz. This is located on the website, but I have it here for you guys too. Let me put it in the box for you all. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. It's a short quiz. It's got about 10 questions relating to um, this training that you guys have already taken. You can look back at this for information if you do need and um, can't remember some of the information we covered. But you can complete this as soon as this is over um, if you do need to do so. Um, and then it must be completed. I know I wrote September 1st. Uh, but essentially, you have to complete it before your funds can be used. Um, so at least the advisors. We don't have any officers in place, so obviously we cannot make that mandatory for officers currently. But um, before advisors can spend any of the funds, which um, most of you know is $250 for the fall semester, and then spring will be to be determined, um, when SBAC meets again in October and you'll submit um, for the spring, but um, your funds would be frozen essentially until you complete the risk management training and the quiz. So thank you guys for attending. I'm gonna turn off the recording now.